Last week, we introduced the book of Colossians we'll be working through in the coming months. And we just looked at the first two verses last week and uh, did a general overview of the book. But today, we're going to get into the sections around Paul's thanksgiving and and prayer for the Colossians. And we're going to leave off the last two verses if this is uh, divided this way in your Bible. It probably is. And we're going to go verses 3 through 12 today. Uh, But there's a a general theme we talked about in the book of Colossians. And that is that the new life we have in Christ demands that we live for him by looking to him. We're going to talk about this over and over throughout the book. The new life we have in Christ demands that we live for him by looking to him. I think sometimes when we get into particularly epistles and, and we're trying to get to the, the meat of it, we skip over these introductory verses or the prayers at the beginning thinking they don't have uh, much content for us. And I hope we'll see today that both in this prayer of thanksgiving and this confident prayer that Paul has for the Colossian believers, that like all good prayers, they are, these are theologically informed prayers, and there's great things that we can learn from them. I want to look at Paul's prayer of, of joyous thanksgiving as he thinks of the Colossian believers, and then his prayer of confidence that they would continue to grow by the work of God in their lives. So, As we approach this text today, please stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the Word of God. And we're going to read verses 3 through 12. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard in the word, or before, in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Father, help us today to consider these words well, that our hearts would be changed by them, or that you would be glorified, we would be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We begin today with Paul's joyous thanksgiving. And and Paul is someone that as you read his epistles, you know this guy prays a lot. Either he does or he's a liar. He begins and he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. This is a a regular undertaking, and Paul is confident in the Colossian church. We discussed this last week. Uh, Colossians is famous for this Colossian heresy, this mix of uh, Gnosticism and Jewish legalism that come together in, in the teachings that were happening around them. But Paul says, you haven't fallen there yet. I always thank God when I think of you. And this is a church he's never met. He's never physically been there. And he comes along and he says, I I always thank the Lord when I think of you. And and why? In verse 4 he says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. That's one of the first things for us to note here is that we can give thanks for faith and the faith of others. Now, does Paul go and say, 
thank you, Colossians, for believing. You're so faithful and, and just you are great. That's not what he says at all. He says, I thank my God for your faith. Because we know that the Lord works in our hearts and that it's not us that brings us to faith but Him, He gets all the credit. The Lord works mightily in His people. And this belief results in the knowledge of, of thanksgiving to the Lord for our salvation and the salvation of others. And, and why does Paul care whether or not they believe? Well, Paul desires that God be glorified. He has a high view of the church. He knows that it's the bride of Christ, and that leads him to give thanks for others around him that are faithful stewards of the gospel. People that continue on in the faith. He doesn't even know them, but he says, since I, I heard of your faith, I heard of how well you've been doing, I'm so thankful for what the Lord is working out in your life. He has a high view of the church and he has a high view of God and passion for God, the glory of God, that will lead him to give thanks when more people worship Jesus. Folks, that's why we as Christians should live life the way that we do. We want to see God receive more and more glory. We want missionaries to go to the field that people that have never known the name of Jesus would give right worship to Jesus as the Lord of creation. The high view of the Lord and passion for the glory of God lead Paul to be thankful for them, but it also lead us to be thankful as well. He gives thanks for their faith and love that they have for all the saints. He puts these two things together. Paul doesn't see a separation between a love for the Lord, an expression of faith in what Jesus has done, and a love for the saints. These things go together, they're two peas in a pod, you cannot separate them, and in fact, they have the same root. Their faith in Jesus Christ and their love for all the saints comes, in verse 4, sorry, verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Hope, faith, love, right, these three, but the greatest of these is love, we read in 1 Corinthians 13. But faith and love come because of the hope laid up for them in heaven. Well, hang on a second. We've got to work this out. Does that logically make sense? We know we can see faith coming because of the hope laid up for you. Right? It, how many of you, right, this should happen, in God's grace it doesn't, but how many of us would say, I know I'm going to hell. Praise the God of heaven. He's sending me to hell. I mean... If he didn't save us, he would still deserve right worship because of who he is. But in his mercy, he has, and Paul directly ties the hope that's laid up for us in heaven to the faith that they possess. That would make sense. But how does the hope laid up for them in heaven result in the love that they have for all the saints? You might try and draw conclusions and say, well, they'll be in them or with them uh, in heaven for eternity, and so we should start being friends now. Um, you can guess from my tone, and what I said, that's bad theology. Love for saints is a natural outworking of a faith in Jesus. And so your hope of heaven, the hope in what's coming, the hope that's in Jesus Christ, results in not only your faith, but everything that follows after. And, and that's exactly what we're talking about throughout the entire book of Colossians. That's why in chapters 3, verses 1 through 4, he says to set your mind on the things above. Because when you have faith because of what's above, because of the hope of heaven, because of your new life in Christ, everything follows after. And you'll see he works out this theology in chapters 1 and 2. That hits chapter 3, verses 1 and 4, that we seek the things that are above. We set our mind on the things that are above. And then verses 5 and following into chapter 4 and verse 6, we see all the expressions of what that holiness should look like. But he begins it here. Paul, in his prayer for the Colossians, is framing his argument for the rest of the book. He says that the root of faith is our eternal hope in heaven. The root of our love for all the saints, the love of the saints that these Colossian believers heard of, is the hope laid up for them in heaven. But this isn't just 
any hope. This isn't some generic theology that comes about. I was, I mentioned a, a podcast in Sunday school. I've been podcast every this week and on dri- in driving. Um, but I was, I was listening to a podcast on uh, the founding fathers, the key founding fathers in America. And there were Christians among like the broader group, but the primary eight men are likely not in heaven. Uh, people know Thomas Jefferson, right? He cut out all the miraculous things about Jesus in the Bible and then called it the Jefferson Bible and they actually gave it to everyone that served in Congress until 1955. They said, hey, here's a, a diminished petty God. But he didn't want to believe in the incarnated Jesus. But a lot of Christians claim John Adams. But Adams was bedfellows with Jefferson in their theology. He didn't believe in a trinity. In fact, he said if he could see the God of heaven but have to believe that he was triune, he would not. Because this is something the, that the human mind cannot comprehend. Uh, he was a, a naturalist um, of sorts. But this isn't a generic hope of, of heaven. This isn't some national religion that we would seek after or think that is something that can be uh, built up in a community falsely. This isn't a good old boy saying, praise God, but not acknowledging that that God is Jesus Christ. He says in verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard because, before in the word of truth, the gospel. There's only one hope, folks, and it's in the gospel. And no matter how virtuous someone is on this earth, and no matter how much we love them, and no matter the good works they've done, hell awaits them apart from belief in the gospel. And this is the only thing that brings about true good works. This is the only thing that brings about any kind of hope. It has to be the word of truth that has come in the gospel. And we might think, but there's so few people that really believe the gospel. And it's true. You you listen to the media, you know, so many Christians will grab the, the least word from a celebrity or an athlete or a politician and hope, oh, maybe they're a believer. Maybe they're on our side. And for the vast majority of them, it's not true. And a lot of times you feel like you're defeated. The garbage that is going around about President Trump's attempted assassination and God's intervention, it's horrible theology. God didn't reach in and sway the path of a bullet. God, from before time began, began determined the path of the bullet and exactly where it would land because he works out all things. To say God has to reach down like he, he started everything and it continues this deistic watchmaker kind of theology, you wind it up and it just takes away. And then sometimes he reaches in and makes this change. That's a low view of God. Don't put your hope in, in men. Don't put your hope in some kind of broader religion. Put your hope in the gospel. And, and when it seems like it fails, like the gospel we're losing over and over, and, and the Republican National Convention just advanced abortion in their national platform, which is heinous, right? They say, oh, well, it should be left to the states. Well, previously, their position was a federal ban on abortion, and that's gone now, and it's heinous. Any inch that's given to, towards murder of those God has made in his image is heinous sin. But don't get discouraged. You've got to imagine the Colossian believers. They're under immense persecution. All this difficulty is going on. And, and they're just discouraged. They're persecuted. They're, they're dealing with not only the Jews that would persecute them, but the pagans around them because they won't worship Caesar. There's all sorts of hardship in life. By and large, they're incredibly impoverished. But he says, you've heard of this before, this hope laid up for you in heaven, in the word of truth, the gospel, verse 6, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the, understood the grace of God and truth. We know that the world is headed towards an evil end. Right? The, the enemy has been given license here on earth. But one day Jesus is coming back and he'll judge and he'll make it all right. 
But in the midst of that, Jesus is drawing myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands to himself. And the gospel works among us and is increasing in the entire world to the ends of the earth. Every day, knees bow and tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and it's not even the day of judgment yet. Folks, don't get discouraged by what you see in this world. The gospel is working and is increasing in the whole world that's bearing fruit. This hasn't ended. This wasn't just to the Colossians here, right? He's writing to them. But this bearing fruit and increasing, these are continuous words. They keep on going. It's happening and it keeps on happening. The gospel is going to continue. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. We don't have to fear. We don't have to be discouraged. We can look at what's going on and, and we look at other churches, other believers, and rejoice that good works are being carried out in their lives. Rejoice in the faith and the love that they have in the saints and that it's a, a true love that's rooted in the hope of heaven that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't be discouraged. Know that it continues in the entire world. And he encourages these believers. He says, this is just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. False teachers are coming in. Epaphras started this church in Colossa. And Paul's saying, this is where the message is coming from. Don't listen to those guys. The teaching that Epaphras has established begins here and continues on. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. He says, Epaphras comes to minister the word of Christ. We can give great thanks on your behalf because of this truth and you're following this truth. And Paul's doing a good job of delineating who is true and who is false in this church in Colossa. So he begins with this prayer of thanksgiving. He's grateful for the saints. He's grateful for what the Lord is doing in them. But we see even in this prayer of thanksgiving the truth that our faith and our love for others come from the hope of heaven and only through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gospel continues. It's bearing fruit and increasing all over the world. In verse 9, Paul switches gears some. He says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. He's bringing up this prayer again, switching from a prayer of thanksgiving to a prayer of confident exhortation, asking that God would keep working in these saints in Colossae. He says, from the day we've heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul begins with doctrine. We begin with doctrine. That's why this is Peak Bible Church. Because we look to the Scriptures. We start with doctrine because it's necessary for everything else in life. When Paul says in chapter 3, set your mind on the things above, he wants them to consider truth. He wants them to think on the Lord, and in doing so, everything else works out. Paul's primary request here is that of God is that the Colossian believers be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This knowledge comes only through his word. We talked about in Sunday school the cessation of additional revelation. This applies to how you decide what to do in your life. It applies to the, the great murky concept in Christianity, for some reason, of the will of God. I know why it's false teaching. That's why it's murky. The will of God is expressed here, folks. You want to know God's good plan for your life? Read the Bible. He put it in a book and He's caused people to like make pretty bindings and, and it's all here together in one spot, right? All these scrolls and everything. We have a codex. It's, it's very convenient. And my probably pretty confident assumption is that every one of you either have this in your home or have very reasonable access. If you don't have one in your home, grab one off the rack on, the way, on your way out the door. There's uh, black ones over on the right. Take the Bible and read it. Determine God's will for your life. 
Have you thought about the fact that if you think you have to figure out some mysterious plan of God for your life, that you're counting on new revelation? God, I need you to show me this path. I need you to show me these things. And God says, obey my word. Consider the wisdom of Scripture. And then operate in Christian freedom within that context. We should not read this verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 9, and say, I need to figure out the knowledge of His will. Or, or Paul is determining that the Colossian believers need to figure out this murky path and how to get on, back onto plan A because we've all messed it up. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to know the Word of God. I want you to know the truth. The knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Everything that we know about God comes through His Word. The most important thing that a believer can do is know the God of the Bible through His Word. There's no other way, Christian. There's no easy way out. Paul doesn't allow for a superficial knowledge here. He doesn't want you to say, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and the rest of it, well, I don't really want to wrestle with that. That's kind of hard, so, so let's just move on. He says that he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The Christian is never done learning about the Lord. You cannot exhaust this book in your lifetime. You can't get to the bottom of it. You can explore, you can dig, you can mine certain parts, but you're never going to get to the end. There's men who have spent the vast majority of their lives searching out small sections of Scripture. There's a guy, last name Honer. He wrote a 900-page commentary on the six chapters of Ephesians. Lloyd-Jones has a 400 or some page book on the three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. This is so deep. And, and, and it's not like it doesn't cover much and you're just hitting one specific area and deep diving on that area. It covers all things pertaining to life and godliness. And you can dig in over and over and over and get deeper and further. You can always grow and change. You can never know enough. You can always become more Christ-like. One of Paul's commands in Ephesians 5 for the husband is that the husband would wash his wife with the water of the Word. And he's paralleling Christ and the church and the husband and the wife. It's what the Lord does with His people. He washes them with the water of the Word. That's why we listen to preaching. It's why we read our Bibles. It's why we read good books that the Word would pour over us over and over and over again, and that we would be cleaned by it. I've used this illustration a number of times, and I uh, unabashedly stole it from Paul Washer. But he talks about a, a grandfather and a grandson. And, and there's a, a barrel up on top of a hill that they need to fill with water. And the grandfather tells the son, hey, here's this bucket. Go down to the stream and, and fill the bucket with water and bring it up here and dump it in the barrel. And you, need to do, you need to do that until it's full. So the grandson runs down the hill and he fills up the bucket with water and he runs back up the hill and he gets to the top and he realized this was a pretty dirty old bucket and he dipped it in the water and some of the dirt came loose and there's holes in the bucket. He thinks, well, they're pretty small holes, so maybe if I run faster... I can get water in the barrel. So he runs back down and he fills it in the stream again and he runs back up to the top and he goes to dump it and he sees there's no water that made it into the barrel again. And maybe if I go a little faster and he tries over and over again, he's dipping the bucket in, into the stream and running up to the barrel and he's trying to put his hand over the bottom and, and plug these holes and he just can't do it. And he finally goes and he says, Grandpa, this is impossible. 
You gave me this rusty, dirty old bucket, and it's got holes in it. And no matter how fast I run, no matter how I try, try to plug the holes, no matter how many times I try, I can't get the water into the barrel. And the grandfather says, but grandson, look at the bucket. And he looks, and the dirt has been washed away, and all the chunks of rust have broken off, and he's got a clean, shiny bucket from dunking it in the water over and over and over again. And as you go to the Word, and sometimes it doesn't feel like it works, and, and sometimes you're on a mountaintop after your devotions, and sometimes you've just drudged through a chapter again, and, and you don't know where you're going, or you've hit the minor prophets, and you're just confused for months. Folks, dunk it in the stream over and over and over again. And you'll be washed by the water of the Word. When Paul talks about his prayer for them, not the thanksgiving, but what he wants God to do in their lives, the first thing he says, which is the root of everything else that follows, is that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That is Paul's chief prayer for the Colossians. And it's my chief prayer for you and for me. That we would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that knowledge, folks, only comes through this Bible. I want to plead with you today, Christian. Some of us would say, I can't read the Bible. It doesn't make sense. I can't understand. It's too hard. I want you to get in your Bible and dig until the Lord gives you something. And go back over and over and over. There's a few key things that we do that prevent us from being able to read the Word and to draw good conclusions from it. The first is that we have enslaved our minds to the things of this world. Satan would love it if we would stare at a screen and not at this book all day. He saps our attention, destroys our minds. We've given ourselves over to things that give quick dopamine hits instead of a slow, deliberate meditation on the things of God. If this has happened to you, if you can look at your life and say, I've given myself over to these things too much. I don't have any attention span. I can't focus on the Word of God. It takes time and discipline, but by the Spirit, your mind can be changed. Stop giving your most precious things that you have, your mind and your time, to the things of the world. But give them to the Lord. And, and there's some things in the Bible that are hard. There's things that are difficult to understand. I blame that on our fallen minds, not on God's very clear, direct word. But even if you aren't ready for steak, the milk is so good. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, chapter, chapter, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Give yourself over to just the clearest teachings of the gospel. The things that even children can understand, because the Bible is sufficient for children to understand the gospel. My friend, Pastor John Snyder, he spoke at our men's breakfast a few months ago, and he spoke at a, uh, a youth retreat that I did when I was working at Mesa Hills. And he was a missionary in Russia for a number of years, and he taught me one phrase in Russian that I've said to Marina before, and I'm going to butcher it now, and now her mom and sister are here, and I'll butcher it in front of them too. So Russian speakers, forgive me. Because there's one word in here that I think is profanity when you say it wrong, but I'm going to try. <laughs> but none of you, that, uh, most of you don't know Russian, so it's okay. But this phrase is Pavtrenya Matsuchenya, and it means that uh, repetition is the mother 
of learning. Is that okay, Marina? I got close? Okay, Marina says it's not too bad. <laughs> Repetition is the mother of learning. I, I, I don't understand this. It's too hard. Go back and grab the smallest thing. Grab the milk. Grab something small and go to it over and over and over again until you know it. Until you know it inside and out. For, for, the, for the next number of months, we're going to be working through the book of Colossians. Take time. Read with us every day through the book of Colossians. It's four chapters. Most of you can probably read this in 15 minutes. If you're a slow reader, maybe it takes you 30. You can give the Lord 30 minutes a day. But just focus on something over and over and over again. If, if repetition has to be the mother of learning, you think your mind is too far gone, grab something small and give yourself to it. Just work on that. Dedicate yourself. Because you'll never be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding unless you get it from the Word of God. And as much as I love listening to podcasts, and as much as, much as I love Bible commentaries and great books on the Scriptures, this is the only thing that promises you life. This is the only book that is sufficient. Commentaries or book, and books are fantastic. I have thousands of them for a reason. And as they supplement this, they are well worth your time. But if you don't know this, you can't tell me where those books are wrong. You're not discerning enough. You can't get there because you don't know what the Scriptures say. Grab a small section of the Scriptures, memorize it, focus on it, and delve into it. I saw a thread on X recently that was comparing the beauty of years past to the kind of stark, plain things of today. And the image on the, on the first image on the page was of streetlights. And it had pictures of streetlights in the late 18, early 1900s that were ornate. And, and there's intricate metal work done, and they're beautiful. And then you see a light post that we have out today. A big stick with a chunk of metal sticking off the end and some bulb that gives a semi-offensive light. The world around us has gone to things that aren't beautiful because we don't take time. Everyone's in a hurry. We're always rushing to get to the next place. We're always concerned about being able to be fully informed or to have all the information. Folks, a little bit of the truth here will benefit you more than anything else in all the world. I want to encourage you, if you feel like you can't read the Scriptures, just be diligent to give yourself to a small portion and to do it over and over. There's great beauty and satisfaction in the Scriptures. It's worth giving ourselves to. He wants us to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. But why? Verse 10, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Do you realize that's the aim of the Christian life? Is that you would walk worthy of Jesus. That your life would be so righteous, so holy, so represent the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would be able to say, I have lived worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus. He says the same things in, in Ephesians 4, verse 1. He says, he implores us to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. The salvation God has worked out for you in chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, walk worthy now. That is what he calls you to here. A manner worthy of the Lord. Now we know none of us will ever get there. We know none of us will be able to uh, be righteous enough. But it doesn't pre prevent us from striving for it, from trying. And he gives us some qualifications or characteristics of what this worthy walk would look like. The first is that we would bear fruit in every good work and be increasing in the knowledge of God. We bear fruit. Paul isn't allowing for a Christian that doesn't bear fruit. 
you can do things out of selfish and vain ambition. There are those that perform righteous works of supposed righteousness that don't yield any fruit. But Paul asks that we would bear fruit in every good work. Why would he qualify the good works with bearing fruit? Because he knows that some people will come in vain self-righteousness. And this is what he sees in those ones that are bringing the Jewish legalism into the church. They're doing these things they say are good works, but they're not tied back to the gospel. They're not filled with knowledge of the word. So they don't matter. The believer that is fully pleasing to the Lord bears fruit out of his knowledge of the word and his adoration of the word. Sincere fruit must be brought forth in the believer's life. And this is the prayer of Paul for the Colossians. But he also wants us to increase in knowledge of God. We've already referenced this. But we are never done growing. We've got to get into the Bible. I would ask you, what concrete steps do you take day by day to get yourself further into the Word? To devote yourself to an increasing knowledge of the Lord? So he wants us to bear fruit in every good work. We've got to bear fruit as Christians. We've got to increase in the knowledge of God. In verse 11 he says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. We are strengthened for endurance and patience. And Christian, I know, I've been there. There's many times when we feel that we are at our end. Times when we feel that we can no longer carry on. But if you're in Christ, if you're filled with the knowledge of His Word, the Lord is the one who sustains us. He can always keep you going further. He can always minister in your life. But you must look to Jesus and His Word. There's nothing else that will sustain you. And many Christians fall into the trap of trying to find things of the world to sustain them. And as good as eating certain ways are for your body, and as good as certain exercises or productivity tips or whatever that looks like, as good as these things are, as wise as they can be, none of them will sustain you. It's only the Word of the Lord that sustains us. He always cares for us. You think you can't go any further? Look to God. He says to be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. You see, I can't go on any further. I'm too tired. It's been too hard. It's too difficult. They, they've come at me again and again, and I give more love and more grace, and I can't keep doing it. I can't express anymore. But God says, with all power, being strengthened by His might, not your own. You can keep going. You can endure. And it's not some drudgery. It's, it's not that you're going to barely eat by if you're in the Word and you know the Lord and the power of His might. He says, for all endurance and patience with joy. This word endurance, it's hupameno. And it means fortitude and perseverance. This is the guy that, that keeps going nonstop and he just digs in and, and grits his teeth and, and he bears with it and he gets things done. That's the, where most of us end when we think about endurance. We think, I've got to just dig down. I've got to make it and I'm going to keep going until the very end. And that's an admirable quality. Right? We want people of determination and solid belief that will dig in until the very end. But that's not what the Lord calls you to alone. He calls you to endurance, this fortitude and, and perseverance, this holding up under great difficulty. But patience here is macrothemia. And it means remaining tranquil while awaiting an outcome. It's not suffering under great load and hating your life. There's tranquility that comes. You bear up under, no matter the strength required, and tranquility with joy. 
The world knows nothing of this. They can't get there. The world gets the endurance that you just dig in and fight for it. The, the world gets the, the tranquility, right? You can give up the responsibility and go sit by a pretty mountain lake and find yourself. But what the world doesn't understand is bearing up under while you're tranquil and with joy. That's only possible through Jesus Christ. No matter what's going on in your life, endurance and patience with joy is possible. Go to the Word. Go to the Lord. Seek after Him. Bear up under, but trust Him in the midst of it. The tranquility doesn't come because you're strong enough. The tranquility doesn't come because you can bear up long enough. It doesn't come from your strength. It comes from the God of heaven who cares for you. And don't forget, the gospel is going out in all the world and it's increasing and bearing fruit, including in you. And as you know the Word, as you dig into the Word, as you grab these little tidbits and you hang on to that, He's going to minister to your soul. And He'll uphold you in ways that you can't even imagine. He closes in verse 12 and says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. A final sign of our worthy walk is hearts that are full of thanks. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. God is bringing about His good will and we fail to give thanks in all of our circumstances because we fail to trust the God that's behind our circumstances. We fail to trust His good plan and we don't believe that He will bring it all about. It is all the work of the Lord. We give thanks to the Father. And why do we give thanks to the Father? Because He has qualified you if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Why wouldn't this produce thanksgiving in us? You didn't qualify. He did. He qualified you. He said you were good. He took the blood of His Son and laid it over your sins. And He qualifies you for inheritance in the saints in light. And that inheritance is glorious. It's never go away. It never goes away. He says this inheritance of the saints and light. And folks, before Jesus, we all hated light. John chapter 3 and verse 19 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. We're all like cockroaches. We hate the light. You flip the light on and they run and scatter in the room. That's what we did. Our works were evil. We hated the Lord. But He saved us because of what His Son has done, because of the Gospel we talked about back in verse 6. We now have the right to, to approach the God of the universe and say, I belong to you. And then walk in light through the knowledge of His Word. Back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. He says, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. You are children of the light because of the work of Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer for the Colossians is meant to inform and embolden them. You're not worthy, but Jesus is. You can't do enough, but Jesus did. And if you 
give yourself over to the Word, you can bear fruit. You can endure with patience and joy. But it's all when we focus our minds on the truth. That the, the new life in Christ requires us to live for Him by looking to Him. That's what Paul is praying for the Colossians. That's what he's going to flesh out through the rest of the book. Let's pray. Father, help us to be people of the Word. We give ourselves to so many other things. We give our time to so many other things. But Lord, only You can satisfy. And You've shown Yourself to us through Your Word. I pray that Peak Bible Church would be a church that is filled with the knowledge of Your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That out of it we would bear fruit that brings You glory. Father, I know there are some here that are suffering, some that can't be with us today because they are suffering. And I pray, Father, for endurance and patience with joy that is only found in who You are. I pray for hearts that would be drawn close to You, that would stick to the truth that we've heard through Your Word and not be tempted to depart as many in Colossa were teaching things that were false and that were contrary to Your Word. Lord, if we would preach any other gospel, let us be accursed. Give us hearts that love truth, that live in light of that truth, and that experience the blessing of being inheritance and light. Lord, that we can know that we are Your children because of the work that You've done. If there is someone here today, Lord, that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray Your Spirit would reveal their sin to them, that they would repent of their sins and turn to You to receive this inheritance of light that You've promised to everyone who would repent and follow after You and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Work mightily in Your people. Lord, save souls. And draw those who already know you to yourself. Be glorified by it. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.